We are joined by Nina Ansari. She's the director of Cambridge MENA Forum, a women's leadership initiative at the University of Cambridge. Nina, a pleasure to have you on the show. Now, firstly, I just want to get your thoughts on the suspected poisoning of schoolgirls in Iran. Just how shocking are these horrific attacks for the country? And can we trust the Iranian government to get to the bottom of it? Thank you for having me and thank you for covering this horrific issue that has been really going on for a couple of months now and accelerated in the last couple of weeks uh, to thousands of young girls being poisoned, deliberately poisoned, and many have been hospitalized with neurological, cardiac, and other issues. It is difficult to trust what the regime says. Um, they have not um, been actively seeking who is responsible for this atrocity. Uh, they have stepped up, or, or so they say recently, only because there has been tremendous pressure um, from the international community to look into who is responsible for this horrific incidences. So um, in the past, the regime has never taken responsibility for its crimes against humanity and for none of the incidences since the death of Masa Amini at the hands of their morality police, including the death of Masa Amini, which started the protests in Iran. Uh, let's talk about those protests. Uh, just two days ago, Iran's judiciary chief reaffirmed that women violating the Islamic dress code will be punished. The government doesn't appear to be relenting here, Nina. Uh, can people power really change the rules of the establishment or are violent reprisals just going to rise? You know, the Islamic Republic has used violent and um, repression to uh, quell protests or any any dissidents. That is something they have uh, methodically done for over four and a half decades now. I don't believe the Islamic Republic is going to change. I don't believe they are going to change their mandatory hijab laws. In fact, the um, hijab is considered to be one of the ideological pillars of the Islamic Republic. In 1979, the founder of uh, the Islamic Republic referred to the veil as the flag of the revolution. So I don't believe the regime is going to uh, take away this law or any other discriminatory laws. This is their modus operandi. And they they uh, have uh, their legitimacy has come into question in, in an unprecedented way, specifically since the death of Masa Amini. And I believe that the diaspora, as well as Iranian civil society, has shown a kind of unity and solidarity that is unprecedented as well. And the regime knows the spotlight is on them in a way uh, that it hasn't been in the last four and a half decades. They must be held accountable for four and a half decades of crimes against humanity, as well as countless other atrocities, both at home and abroad. Yeah, Nina, absolutely. I mean, last year we've seen remarkable images of young women uh, out in the streets um, tearing their, their headscarves and burning them even. But some observers are saying that the size and frequency of these demonstrations uh, are both on the wane and that the protesters are still a minority voice in Iran. How worried are you that the momentum will die out or, or fade away and people eventually retreat and continue on with their lives? Well, to be frank, there's no going back. Uh, people's grievances still exist. They're, they're still there. And one of the reasons many believe that the girls have been targets of this regime and it's difficult to um, trust anything they have to say with reference to finding who is culpable for this crime is because these young girls have been pioneers of this freedom movement. They have been at the forefront of Iran's freedom movement. And the regime looks at these women as a big threat to their survival. Just to remind, in the aftermath of Masa Amini's death, um, Serena Ismailzadeh, a 16-year-old girl, just protesting peacefully for freedom. Another 16-year-old girl, Nika Shah Karami, they were beaten to death, bludgeoned to death by security forces in Iran. Uh, so let's not uh, forget and let's remind that this regime 
has and continues to target young women in Iran. And I don't believe the protests um, have died down. They, they ebb and flow. But as I mentioned, uh, the problems are still lingering. People have not forgotten. People continue to suffer. And they, uh, I don't feel that anybody in Iran or even in the diaspora is going to stop spotlighting these atrocities. And the overall objective is the demise of this regime, uh, hopefully, which will breathe life into the people of Iran after four and a half decades. Nina, in December, Iran's attorney general claimed that the repressive morality police had been abolished. Was that a stunt by the government to try and placate protesters? What do we know about the state of the morality police in the country today? Yes, I, I do remember that. That was never an official edict. That was something that was put out there. I believe it was part of another one of their PR stunts. The morality police is, is still in place. Uh, that they, Their people are still being um, arrested for improper veiling. Uh, the hijab is enforced throughout the country. So there is no end to the regime and their discriminatory practices towards women. Nina, are sanctions, you know, as a freeze or travel bans the best way to show the Iranian people that the global community care about human rights and not just the Iran, the nuclear deal? And if not, what can the international community do to support the, the efforts? Well, continuing to amplify people's voices and their plight um, is, is hugely instrumental to keep shining a light, a protective light on the people of Iran. Uh, sanctions are uh, to a certain extent effective. The other objective is to get the IRGC on a terror list. Um, it's not only hugely symbolic, but also you're talking about a multi-billion dollar empire that not only wreaks havoc in Iran, but also imports its criminalities to the uh, international arena. It has become over the years, it's turned into a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, they control everything from the banking to oil and gas to transportation. They are essentially the supreme leader's personal terror tool. And as such, uh, placing them on a terror list is hugely instrumental. Um, the other issue is you brought up is the JCPOA or the Iran nuclear deal. It is of crucial importance for Western governments not to engage with Iran, not to revive this nuclear deal. As we all know, the nuclear deal's overriding issue has always been curbing Iran's nuclear capabilities. Uh, given this regime's 44-year uh, uh, crimes against humanity, atrocities, economic mismanagement, corruption, uh, they're, they're every everything you can imagine that they've done to the people, I don't think it's in the best interest of this freedom movement and all the sacrifices people have made to date to engage with the criminal regime. So that is number one. Number two, as I mentioned, is getting the IRGC on a terror list and continuing to find ways from travel bans to uh, you know increase sanctions and also isolating and not engaging with anybody from this regime is of vital importance to the people of Iran. Nina, thank you so much for your insights this morning. We'll leave it there. Nina Ansari, Director of Cambridge MENA Forum Women's Leadership Initiative at the University of Cambridge.